Hello, I'm Douglas Guilfoyle, and in today's recording, I want to discuss the issue of state immunity in international criminal law. Now, it sometimes scandalizes students new to the subject that having studied international crimes in such detail, we then come to the difficult bit about getting defendants before a national or international court. And the question arises, well, why on earth should there be any kind of immunity for senior state officials or for governmental acts in relation to international crimes? Wasn't all this done away with at Nuremberg? Hasn't customary international law moved past this point? And the answer is no, not necessarily. And in order to understand why that's the case, we need to go into a certain amount of detail and we need to understand the origins of state immunity and how it has developed before national courts and then how it might apply before international courts and particularly current controversies. At the time I am recording this in 2018, there are ongoing debates in the International Criminal Court itself. There's a hearing in progress about the uh, extent to which states such as Jordan are in breach of the International Criminal Court statute or not for failing to surrender President al-Bashir of the Sudan to the court. And we'll come back to that in a moment. Now, to begin, uh, what, here we have an image of uh, President Charles Taylor, formerly, uh, of, formerly the President of Liberia, who was convicted before the Special Court of Sierra Leone. He is, in fact, the only former head of state convicted by a tribunal with international elements on the basis that customary international law denies that someone can plead state immunity to an international crime. Now, the Special Court for Sierra Leone was, in fact, a court established within the justice system of Sierra Leone, but in cooperation with the United Nations. And we'll come back to the significance of those issues later. But we just need to be quite clear that the only case that has asserted such a principle is the Charles Taylor case before the Special Court for Sierra Leone. Now, let's deal with some introductory concepts. We need to deal with a number of basic distinctions and definitions. So first, here's the as it were, formalist, positivist point of view put by the International Court of Justice in 2002 in the arrest warrant case, which we'll come back to. But there, the court made the following point. Immunity from criminal jurisdiction and individual criminal responsibility are quite separate concepts. While jurisdictional immunity is procedural in nature, criminal responsibility is a question of substantive law. Jurisdictional immunity may well bar prosecution for a certain period or for certain offences. It cannot exonerate the person to whom it applies from all criminal responsibility. Now, the point of that quote is this. What the ICJ is saying there is all the law of immunities is are a set of procedural bars. They say you can't try this person at this time before this court, but you might be able to try them at another time or before another court and we'll come to that. But they're saying in principle, they do not see there to be any conflict between international criminal law and the law of immunities. What we're talking about is a question of procedure. Now you may think that is excessive formalism and certainly some commentators do, but these are the propositions from which we're starting. Now, the other point is that when we talk about immunity for governmental acts, immunity for acts of state, those immunities must attach to individuals because states can only act through individuals. States are legal abstractions. If state immunity doesn't attach to individuals, then it doesn't exist. Um, finally, we need to distinguish personal immunities those held by virtue of the fact that you are in a particular high office. Those are called immunity rationae personae, and uh, they are generally held to be absolute while you are in office. Then the second type of immunity is immunity attaching to official acts, immunity rationae materiae. So this would cover any official act committed by any government official.
So we need to bear that distinction in mind and we'll come back to it on a number of occasions. The other thing to point out is that the case law in this field is complex. If you look at a textbook, it may throw any number of cases at you. Uh, and you'll see different principles being espoused by different courts in different jurisdictions. The one thing I would caution is that you need to think about which box the case fits into. So where you're dealing with cases uh, such as Al Adsani or Jones and Saudi Arabia from the courts of the United Kingdom, which deal with whether an individual can sue a foreign government official who is involved in torture, that ruling, rulings there regarding immunity don't necessarily tell us very much about what we might be interested in, which is the question of immunity in criminal proceedings before an international court, because those questions are addressed by cases in a different box. Similarly, uh, the question of criminal proceedings before national courts may well have some influence on the issue of immunities in respect of international courts, particularly where those international courts are set up by treaty and what is being in effect delegated is the jurisdiction states could themselves exercise. But there are certain cases which suggest, particularly the Charles Taylor case, that there are no immunities before an international court, whatever that means, because let's remember a court that can try international crimes can be set up in a number of different ways. Um, finally, in terms of my schematic, it's worth noting that the question of immunities, state immunity, doesn't arise in international proceedings for questions of state responsibility or monetary damages, because that sort of proceeding, a state responsibility proceeding, can only be conducted by consent. So you don't need a rule of immunity, because the point of the law of immunities is to prevent a state's conduct being judged by a court or tribunal without that state's consent. And that's the issue we're concerned with, as we'll come on to in a moment. So I want to talk now about some questions of the classic theory of state immunity, because it's hard to understand where we are now without some exploration of where we've come from. So the starting proposition is absolute sovereign immunity. And the images I had on the previous slide were of Chief Justice Marshall of the United States Supreme Court and a schooner because the case we're about to come to is uh, the question uh, that was addressed in um, the schooner exchange case. In any event, the proposition as I have it on the slide is essentially the rule is one of absolute immunity. A state is absolutely immune from the jurisdiction of foreign courts. This follows from the sovereign equality of states expressed in Latin as par in parum non habet imperium. One sovereign cannot exercise power over another. Therefore, it follows that one state's judicial arm can it, cannot set itself above another state and judge the latter's conduct. That would be a breach of sovereign equality. So as Marshall, Chief Justice Marshall of the US Supreme Court put it in Schooner Exchange and McFadden in 1813, one sovereign being in no respect amenable to the jurisdiction of another can be supposed to enter foreign territory only under an express license or in the confidence that the immunities belonging to his independent sovereign station, though not expressly stipulated, are reserved by implication and will be extended to him. So this is the idea that when you interact with uh, another state on its territory, your sovereignty is either respected by an expressly granted immunity from jurisdiction or an implicitly granted immunity from jurisdiction. We'll come back to some of that logic later. But the key point is this, that is the rule. Absolute sovereign immunity for all official, for all official government acts and complete personal inviolability in the case of certain high office holders, unless an exception applies. So the question is, how do we establish the exception? So first we need to look at the trend in case law regarding foreign states before national courts. Uh, and here we have a picture of uh, the Supreme Court in uh, the United Kingdom, although one of its uh, critical cases from the UK, um, Pinochet number three, which we'll come to, was decided by 
uh, the prior institution, the House of Lords, which has now been reconfigured as the Supreme Court. In any event, the point is that that classic doctrine of absolute state immunity, while logical as a matter of international law, was terribly inconvenient. So uh, it made commercial dealings with a foreign state very difficult. For example, why would national traders pay to uh, fit out or provide services to a foreign embassy if there was no guarantee they would ever get paid and if there was no way to sue that embassy if it failed to pay its bills. Further, as across the course of the 20th century, 19th and 20th century states themselves developed trading arms which essentially had an unfair competitive advantage if they were immune from local jurisdiction and could engage in commercial behaviour uh, in the same way as anyone else. So the basic agreement that arose in the case law is that states should not always be immune. The problem then becomes what's the applicable rule that tells us when a state is or is not immune. So it's commonly framed as a distinction between acts jure imperii and acts jure gestionis. So you focus on the nature of the act, those that can only be performed by a sovereign, acts jure imperii, and those that could be performed by any individual, acts jure gestionis, um, which are commercial in nature and could be subject to the jurisdiction of the territorial sovereign. So you classify the acts by their nature and say sovereign acts attract immunity, but ordinary commercial acts do not. Um, now that proved to be a difficult distinction to apply in practice. What do you do, in, as in the Trentex Trading Corporation case, when uh, a foreign state, Nigeria, buys a large supply of concrete which seems like a commercial transaction anyone could perform, but has bought it for the purpose of making military barracks. So is it governed by the sovereign purpose or the commercial nature of the transaction? And in Congreso del Partido, there was a case about the government of Cuba diverting a um, shipment of sugar to a different port uh, in violation of uh, contractual agreement when... Um, the state to which it was sending the sugar fell out of political favour. So there was a political decision behind diverting sugar, but the diversion was done through ordinary instruments of private law. The charter company was told um, you know, contractually, uh, you are now going to a different port. So, sorry, on that point, i just say that while the distinction was difficult to apply, in general, UK courts weren't swayed by the idea of an underlying sovereign purpose. If the powers relied upon in the transaction were ordinary private commercial law powers, then sovereign immunity didn't attach. In any event, the point being here, exceptions were found. So the way I'd summarise this is to say that the trend in treaty law and statute law is to uphold this general principle of immunity of foreign states from national courts' jurisdictions, but to list certain exceptions. And common amongst those exceptions are commercial dealings, quite widely defined, and perhaps more importantly for our purposes, the idea of territorial torts. So where a wrong is done by a foreign state within the territorial jurisdiction of the state which wishes to judge that conduct. Now, that may constitute an exception to immunity, and that becomes important later. But this idea of commercial dealings and territorial torts as exceptions to a general rule is found, for example, in the UN Convention on Jurisdictional Immunities of States and Their Property, uh, and in national legislation such as the Australian Foreign States Immunities Act or the UK State Immunity Act. The basic point then we have to consider in the context of criminal law is this. If it is accepted in civil cases that state immunity is not absolute and there's a distinction between acts jure imperii, which are immune, and acts jure gestionis, which are not, is a similar approach taken in matters of criminal law or could it be? So this brings us directly to the question of the immunities enjoyed by individuals under public international law. And we have here images of uh, former President Charles Taylor and uh, Senator Pinochet, uh, who we'll come to in a moment. So first, again, coming back to this idea about individuals and state immunity, we need to once again distinguish between personal immunities that attach to particular high office holders and called immunity ratione personae. So normally this extends 
only to um, the big three, uh, the, pr uh, the head of state, the head of government and the foreign minister. But the logic in the arrest warrant case suggests that any other senior government official travelling um, on official business who needs to travel as part of their functions would also enjoy potentially immunity ratione personae. So on that basis, UK courts, for example, have applied that principle um, to uh, a visiting trade minister who was um, accused of torture. Then we have immu immunity that attaches to official acts called immunity ratione materiae. So the other point that just needs to be reinforced here is that an office holder who benefits from immunity ratione personae will still have immunity ratione materiae once they leave office, but only in respect of their official acts. So you have complete personal inviolability under the ratione personae principle if you are one of the relevant types of office holder, but after you leave office to the extent that your conduct was official during your period of office, you will continue to have immunity ratione materiae. So, um, who's entitled to immunity ratione, materi ratione personae? Let's go into this in slightly more detail. So, importantly, the head of state is entitled to complete personal inviolability and absolute immunity from criminal jurisdiction. They can't be arrested, they can't be served with process. Um, immunity from civil jurisdiction is more complex, uh, but broadly, they'll still remain immune in respect of official conduct. Um, head of government and foreign ministers. So, again, as I've said, the arrest warrant case before the ICJ finds serving, heads of government and foreign ministers enjoy the same immunities as heads of state, as these are necessary to carry out their functions. Um, so on this basis, it makes no difference whether such a person is travelling for their official purposes or for personal reasons. You can't arrest them on holiday because that would imp impinge their ability to do their functions in general. And as I've said, the same logic may apply to other officials involved in international relations as part of their duties. The important point here is that the immunity belongs to the state, not the individual. The state must assert it if a um, foreign court appears to be engaging in conduct that impinges on the immunity, and it can also waive it. Uh, and the question then becomes whether it can be waived only expressly or possibly implicitly. Um, but certainly the point that the state must assert the immunity uh, is an important one. All right, so let's consider then official act immunity, immunity ratione materiae. So this attaches to all official state acts and will therefore protect a wide class of officials in respect of their conduct. And as we've said, uh, high office holders will continue to have um, official act immunity once they leave office. Once again, the immunity belongs to the state, not the individual, and the state may waive it. Further, it is expressly for the state to invoke it if local authorities fail to respect it. And that principle is outlined by the International Court of Justice in uh, Djibouti and France. So how does this then work in criminal cases? So we'll consider immunity ratione personae first, then immunity ratione materiae. So there has been some suggestion that uh, there is inherently no immunity for international crimes because they're contrary to Jus Kogans. Jus Kogans rules prevail over all other rules of international law and therefore should prevail over rules regarding immunity. That has a certain logic. Uh, there is some case authority in support of it, such as Blaskic, but this is not the trend of the jurisprudence. This is not upheld in the majority of cases. Um, so the ICJ found there was no such exception to personal immunities in the arrest warrants case. As we've said, it took the view that immunities were only procedural and therefore there was no conflict with substantive norms. It noted, however, a number of exceptions to this. First, people covered by personal immunity could still be tried before the courts of their own country. Second, uh, they could be tried by the national courts of foreign states if the immunity was waived by their sending state. Um, three, uh, after they've left office, they can be um, prosecuted for uh, any acts committed during office in a private capacity. So effectively, that's saying that, you know, immunity ratio and immunity still applies. 
And four, um, the ICJ noted that uh, people protected by immunity ratio personae could be prosecuted before certain international criminal tribunals having jurisdiction. Now, a lot of weight is often put on point four. I'd just like to address points one, two, and three quickly. Um, points one, two, and three aren't, I would suggest, very encouraging. Unless someone has fallen from power and favour, they are unlikely to be prosecuted before the courts of their own country. And indeed, if you hold immunity ratio and materiae, that's not the case. You are the president, the head of government, or the foreign minister. Uh, secondly, uh, again, if you are supported by your home government, they are unlikely to waive the immunity. So situation one and two don't seem likely to arise. Further, um, situation three, uh, again, suggests that official act immunity potentially applies um, for anything done in a governmental capacity. So we have the question then about, well, are are international crimes, for example, such that they can't be treated as official government conduct. But fourth, we come to the uh, international criminal tribunals having jurisdiction. Now, this is not an assertion, a la the Charles Taylor case, that there's a rule of customary international law that as soon as you're before an international criminal tribunal, there is no plea of immunity. So I would suggest that it is possible to get too excited because about that proposition, because what is said at point four is not that there is no immunity before international criminal tribunals in all cases. It's saying the tribunal itself must have jurisdiction. And for example, the International Criminal Court has jurisdiction only in respect of uh, offences committed um, by uh, the nationals of member states or on the territory of member states. Its jurisdiction is limited and, as we'll come to, uh, Article 98 expressly preserves the immunities under international law of non-state parties. Nonetheless, one might say that, well, any number of tribunal charters, such as the London Charter of the Nuremberg IMT, say you can't plead immunity before the court. And that's fine as far as it goes, but the question then is, how do you get before the court? You can only be surrendered to the court through a process of national law, and it's at the national level that immunities would be pleaded. And of course, as we say, as I've said, we have the statement in the Charles Taylor case that there is inherently no claim to immunities before international criminal tribunals. But that simply raises the question of, was the Special Court for Sierra Leone really an international tribunal? It was established within the national courts of Sierra Leone, albeit with international cooperation. Let's turn now to official act immunity. So our key case here is Pinochet No. 3, heard before the House of Lords in the United Kingdom in 1999. So the question here was, could Senator Pinochet, who was present in London for medical treatment, uh, who himself was a former Chilean head of state, be extradited to face charges under the Convention Against Torture in Spain. So the only thing he can be covered by is official act immunity because he's no longer the head of state. And immunity is going to be relevant because the question is uh, not only can the UK extradite him, but to not his home jurisdiction, but another jurisdiction. So immunity is going to be relevant in both the UK and Spain. So the question becomes, can he have any claim to immunity under the Convention Against Torture? Now, part of the problem here is that torture is essentially defined as an official act under the Convention. It's only torture if it's conducted by a state official or with the acquiescence or encouragement of a state official. That's part of the definition itself. However, um, the Convention then subjects the crime of torture to a prosecute or extradite obligation. That is, when you find a torturer in your jurisdiction, you're either meant to assert jurisdiction under the Convention over them and prosecute them yourself, or extradite them to a jurisdiction which is prepared to. So if there's a credible case against uh, Senator Pinochet of torture, which there was, he was plainly a torturer, 
then under the convention one would expect the UK either had to prosecute him or send him to a willing jurisdiction such as Spain. But the problem was this question of state immunity. Now it's a very complex case to read because each of the law lords gives a separate opinion and each separate uh, opinion has separate logic. But essentially, for our purposes, we can say there's a narrow reading, which is that the Convention Against Torture removes, probably through an implicit waiver, claims to immunity ratione materiae in respect of torture, which essentially would otherwise exist at customary international law. The broad reading is that no plea of state immunity is permissible in any violation of use Kogan's. So you have some judges in each camp. Uh, but the narrow reading is probably the one that has uh, been taken up in subsequent case law. Uh, and in particular, this statement of Lord Brown Wilkinson, who's often treated as having written the leading opinion in Pinochet. He reasoned that the convention must exclude immunity ratione materiae. He carefully didn't use the language of waiver, but he found that the drafting inherently excluded such claims to immunity, otherwise the whole elaborate structure of universal jurisdiction over torture committed by officials is rendered abortive and one of the main objectives of the torture convention to provide a system under which there is no safe haven for torturers will have been frustrated. In essence, he says, you can't have a system that embeds this uh, prosecutor extradite obligation and at the same time have immunity because the two things would be in conflict. So the prosecute or extradite obligation must implicitly remove any ability, or expressly, in essence, remove any ability to plead official act immunity. So the question then is, how's that principle been applied subsequently? Again, a lot of the leading case law here is from the UK. Uh, so an important case is the Kurtz Bat case in 2011. Um, essentially, Germany here sought the extradition of uh, Mr. Kurtz from the UK to face charges in Germany. Uh, Mr. Kurtz himself was a Mongolian security official who'd been involved in the violent kidnapping of a Mongolian citizen in Paris and then uh, moving him through Germany on the way to Mongolia. Now, interestingly, Mongolia says, yes, we did this, it was wrong, we've made a formal apology to Germany, but we are saying this was official conduct and we are asserting immunity in respect of Mr Kurtz. So how do UK courts deal with this? Well UK courts rejected the plea of immunity on the basis that the acts were committed on the territory of the state asserting criminal jurisdiction and two, neither the official's presence nor their action was consented to. Now this embodies a kind of interesting drawing on principles we can find elsewhere. So first, it sounds a bit like in a civil context, a commercial context, the territorial torts exception. There's something special about the fact that this conduct was committed uh, against national law within the territory of the pleading state. Um, now we can read too much into that perhaps because that is the only situation in which state immunity will in fact be relevant. Uh, but more than that, uh, neither the official's presence nor action was consented to. Now that seems to go straight to the ideas in Schooner Exchange about the fact that the international law of immunity is based on some kind of express or implied license about what happens when a government official enters another state's territory. But they have to do so with, again, the territorial state knowing they're there and potentially uh, it would be relevant to know whether um, the course of conduct that resulted in the harm had been approved by the territorial state. For example, uh, the foreign state was allowed to operate um, a military base and the conduct complained of occurred within the base. There might be some question about whether there's immunity within the boundaries of the base. Nonetheless, it was a uh, that is where we get to with Kurtzbatt. Then we have the Nezar case uh, in Switzerland where the court rejected immunity in respect of international crimes despite um, foreign ministry advice that uh, the crimes in question could attract official act immunity. Nonetheless, it's perhaps significant in that case that the relevant state did not assert immunity. 
Um, we should also note in this context uh, the prosecution of um, uh, Hissen Habre, the former dictator of Chad, for the crime of torture before the extraordinary African chambers in Senegal in 2016. Now, now again, this uh, would seem to be a reasonably straightforward application of the Pinochet principle at one level. But for a long time, Senegal had refused to prosecute uh, Mr. Habre on a number of grounds, and um, Belgium eventually requested his extradition under the torture convention, saying, well, if you won't prosecute him, we will, therefore you must extradite him to us. And that case went before the ICJ. The ICJ did not order um, Mr. Habre's extradition, rather it ordered his prosecution. And if Senegal refused to do that, then said Senegal would need to extradite him to a jurisdiction, be it Belgium or somewhere else, uh, that was prepared to prosecute him. And so uh, Senegal then turned to the African Union that helped establish uh, the extraordinary African chambers in Senegal in 2016, where Mr. Habre was prosecuted and convicted of torture. So we can say that the case law is not entirely consistent uh, after Pinochet. Um, certainly Habre is consistent with that. Uh, the Nezar case seems to stand for a broader principle, and the Kurtz Bat um, seems to introduce this sort of territorial jurisdiction uh, question. All right. So the question then is, well, what do, what do experts make of this diversity of practice? And we've talked before about the role of the International Law Commission. Well, there, there have been differing views. So the first rapporteur on this issue, who is charged with attempting to codify the existing state of the law, uh, Ambassador uh, Kolodkin, said, the only exception is where criminal jurisdiction is exercised by the territorial state and it didn't consent to the presence of the official or the activity giving rise to the relevant crime. Uh, so essentially saying the only exception you're going to find is um, the Kurtz Bat uh, principle. Uh, a similar case would perhaps be Rainbow Warrior where um, French Secret Service personnel bombed a Greenpeace vessel in New Zealand's uh, well, within New Zealand. All right. Um, now, Kolodkin uh, dismisses a number of other arguments. He say that uh, he comes to the view that um, it's not the case that international crimes cannot be considered official acts, and as a matter of common sense, that must be right. Very often, you know, torture is defined as an official act. War crimes could be committed as a matter of government policy. They're certainly committed by government agents. Crimes against humanity will often be uh, committed in pursuance of a state policy. They must be official acts. To say anything otherwise is quite artificial. Uh, he puts aside the argument that immunity is incompatible with individual responsibility, and certainly the International Court of Justice said in arrest warrant case effectively the same thing. Uh, that the use Kogan's nature of international crimes prevails over immunity. Again, he's in good company with the International Court of Justice. Uh, there is a customary international law exception to immunity for international crimes. As we've noted, um, the case law on that is relatively thin, and that the availability of universal jurisdiction for such crimes is incompatible with immunity. Um, now, that might sound contrary to Pinochet, but what we have in Pinochet is rather than universal jurisdiction as a customary principle, express treaty obligations to which states have voluntarily consented, which might be thought to implicitly waive immunity. So you have waiver arising out of treaties to which states have specifically consented rather than a general rule of international law. Um, however, a quite different view was taken by the second rapporteur uh, addressing the same question, Professor Escobar Hernandez. Um, that report proposed that there would be no immunity for genocide, crimes against humanity, war crimes, apartheid, torture, or enforced disappearances, that this was simply established as a matter of international law. Now, that had a proposal had a mixed reception. Um, so normally, uh, it's a good sign if a proposal is adopted uh, unanimously or by consensus or without a vote at the International Law Commission. Um, a vote had to be called on these provisions, and 
uh, the vote was divided. Further, when the report went to the United Nations General Assembly's sixth committee, uh, which is the subcommittee of the General Assembly that deals with questions of international law, it was subjected to criticism. Now, we can debate how many voices were raised for or against the report in all of these forums, but the point is the fact that there was debate, that there was criticism, uh, that a vote had to be called and that the provisions were adopted provisionally, not as a sort of final settled text, all tends to undermine the idea that the proposition put forward by Professor Escobar Hernandez is uncontroversial. And if it's controversial, it's going to be hard to say there's a pineo juris. So we might say that this looks like, in terms of the mandate of the International Law Commission, more like a call for the progressive development of the law rather than a codification of what the law presently is. And there's a very good discussion of these recent de developments in the uh, Wick, uh, Wickremer Singh essay in uh, Professor Evans' edited volume, um, International Law, uh, the fifth edition with Oxford University Press. Right. Well, we might come to the view that all of this thus far has been somewhat depressing. Um, on the whole, it seems difficult to find an exception to immunities for international crimes. The question then must be, is there an exception of such a kind before the International Criminal Court? Now, a problem is provided in making the argument that there can never be any immunities before the International Court by the seeming contradiction between Articles 27 and Articles 98. Article 27 says you cannot plead head of state immunity before the International Criminal Court. However, Article 98 says in uh, cooperating with the court to surrender individuals to the court, state parties must respect immunities arising under international law or agreements uh, with other states. Now, how do you square that? One provision says no immunity, the other says respect immunity. Well, the point is they address different issues. One is the arguments you can raise once you're before the court, Article 27, and the other is the question of how you would get a defendant before the court by a process of extradition or surrender, Article 98. So the substance of it is you can still plead immunity in that process of getting someone to the court, Article 98. Now, the controversy has arisen because multiple ICC member states have failed to arrest President al-Bashir of the Sudan and sent him to the ICC following a UN Security Council referral of the Sudanese situation to the court. So the question is, in the context of a Security Council referral, does Article 98 prohibit such surrender? Sudan is not a party to the ICC statute. Now, on the Pinochet logic, we could say Article 27 implicitly waives any claim to immunity as amongst the state parties. That's fine. The question is, what about a non-state party such as Sudan? So there were two decisions in 2011 by the ICC pretrial chamber in respect of the non-surrender uh, of Bashir, first by Malawi and Chad, as he travelled around Africa. And the ICC pretrial chamber said, there's a rule of customary international law rendering a head of state immunity inapplicable before international criminal courts of all types. Uh, so essentially taking the Charles Taylor line. Now, um, this was subjected to stringent criticism by Professor Gatea in a number of articles. But essentially, she says um, two things. First, if there is a rule about international courts, that's irrelevant at the level of national arrest and surrender proceedings. These aren't international courts that are trying to arrest and surrender him. They're national courts. So that doesn't work. Second, if Article 27, on a Pinochet number three kind of logic, waives immunities as amongst the state parties, that doesn't apply to Sudan because it's not a state party. We then have a further case where um, a different chamber of the International Criminal Court takes a different approach. So in the Democratic Republic of the Congo case, uh, an ICC trial chamber in 2014 said, the UN Security Council referral implicitly waived any immunities. Now that's fine, you can say that um, Sudan is now bound in a sense to the statute, but the difficulty that then arises is that the UN Security Council resolution is only expressly drafted to be binding on Sudan. It doesn't impose obligations of uh, 
non-recognition of immunity is expressly on other states, um, nor does it really say anything directed to the role of other states in um, assisting uh, prosecution at the ICC. And as I said earlier, at the time I'm recording, there's presently hearings before uh, the International Criminal Court Appeals Chamber regarding the failure of Jordan to surrender um, al-Bashir to the court, where a variety of arguments are being put by notable international law scholars, all of which can be found on the court's website. Uh, well, that concludes our introduction to uh, immunities and international criminal law. Uh, I hope you can see that it's an unsettled and developing field and that this presentation has been of interest. I look forward to discussing these issues more with you in class. Thank you for your attention.